Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. A little bit of an extra video this week, purely because I was sitting down, working away today. As I got to the end of my shift, I thought, you know what? There's probably enough that we can do another video in between whatever probably comes in the next few days. You know, there's new signing on the way. There's people leaving behind the scenes. Uh, little things going on with the uh, the academy as well, and also someone rising in prominence uh, on the staff behind the scenes as well. So I thought, you know what, it's probably enough that we can have a little chat. Obviously, if you only want your chats once a week, feel free to <laughs> skip this one and head to the next one, which will probably be Monday or Tuesday. But if you want a little bit extra, let's have a chat about all things Tottenham Hotspur. I think we have to start off with the latest bit of news, which um, I got told just as I was about to finish work, which obviously prolonged my shift slightly, that uh, Greta Steinson, uh, it appears, is on his way out of Tottenham Hotspur. If you're not aware who Greta Steinson is, he is Spurs' uh, performance director. He was, for those with a uh, a better memory, uh, used to play for Bolton, used to be um, Icelandic international, um, joined Spurs less than 12 months ago. He had been at Everton for three years before that as head of recruitment and development, and he had been at Fleetwood Town before that for four years as their technical director. So he came in as part of Fabio Paratici's big overhaul behind the scenes. Um, essentially, they kind of replaced what Steve Hitchin, who was the performance director, I'm trying to remember his exact title now. Um, no, so he was technical performance director, that was it, and Greta Steinson came in as performance director. So Steve Hitchin had this kind of all-encompassing role, and then Fabio Pratici came in and went, no, no, I want to split that up. And, well, actually, to be fair, Hitchin was there for a little while before he left, but then as soon as he left, became this real plan to have essentially three or four people doing what Hitchin was doing before. Um, and, yeah, now here we are, 12 months on, less than 12 months on. It was July last year, and obviously it's June now. And uh, Steinson is heading off. Um, obviously, practically left in April, um, officially resigned in April. Uh, Scott Munn coming in as Chief Football Officer, so if you weren't aware of the structure before, essentially it was Paratici, uh, Levy, Paratici, then you had uh, Greta Steinson kind of as his number two, Andy Scolding as an ever so slightly more junior member who is the, oh, I'm going to get his, name, his title right, there's so many different ones, I can't remember his one, something about, I can't remember, I don't want to bodge it up and just say the wrong title. But he works essentially in creating a pathway between... Um, oh, actually, I might have it further down. Um, I've got a load of notes here. Um, I've got it here somewhere. This is a really great bit of video that you'll love. Not... Oh, I'll find it. I'll find it later. It, it's in my massive notes because we're going to talk about Leonardo Gabanini a little bit later. And I think he crops up in there. So anyway, Levy, Pratici, Steinson, then Scolding. And then underneath there was Simon Davies, who was the head of coaching methodology that was in charge of essentially making sure that everything, the whole ethos of the first team was running through into the academy as well. And then you did have Dean Rastrick, but Dean Rastrick has since left and um, Simon Davies has been promoted from his head of coaching methodology to becoming uh, academy director. So that's happened in the last few days as well. Um yeah, sorry, just seeing some news that Juventus are negotiating a voluntary withdrawal from the Conference League as a way to settle with UEFA. I saw someone uh, joking that uh, that maybe Spurs would end up in there. That would be some turnaround. <laughs> um, I don't even know if that's feasible. Um, hey, we'll find out. It's Tottenham. Anything can happen with Spurs. But yeah, so that was the structure. Now, what's happening is, obviously, <clears throat> Scott Munn's coming in as the chief football officer in a newly created role, which is very much like Pratichy was never really Daniel Levy's number two, as it were. He was just a high-ranking uh, member on the board that was in charge of a lot of the football stuff. Scott Munn, the idea is that he comes in very much as a number two to Daniel Levy and will take charge of all football-related matters. So he clearly, although he 
officially starts on July the 1st. You'll love that about football clubs. Everyone officially has a start date, but actually ends up... Uh, they just seem to happen to work earlier than that somehow, or are consulted on matters is the best way to put it. Um, so Scott Munn has clearly been looking at the structure and thinking, yeah, that doesn't work for me, or Daniel Levy and he have been talking about this and it doesn't work. So piece by piece, it kind of feels like the practice structure is now being pulled apart after less than... 12 months um, and obviously Greta Steinson going is a big piece of that so from what I understand staff at Spurs were informed yesterday that he was heading off um, and the they were told that um, <clears throat> Scott Munn was going to be assuming a lot of his responsibilities in the meantime until Spurs appoint this long looked for director of football. Um, what I should stress from what I keep hearing, I don't know whether the title is going to be director of football. That may be something that ends up getting shifted in the mix, whether it ends up being another performance director, whether it ends up being a technical director, a sporting director, I don't know. But the sense is it, they may not be called a director of football. They'll have a director of football style role, but that may not be the actual title of the job. So you'll have Levy, Munn, this new person coming in, um, then Andy Scolding in there as well, um, Postacoglu, of course, in there as well, um, and uh, Simon Davies as the uh, academy director. So that's your kind of chain there. And, um, yeah, they need to kind of obviously get moving <clears throat> on the director of football type because... There's a lot there to be taking on, uh, especially with Stein. Steinson's role, from what I understand, was very much uh, administrative role in both first team and academy. Um, a lot of the bits and pieces um, that would go on. I think Fabio Pratici was not, how do I put this um, in a polite way? He was more focused on the, the nitty gritty of transfers and things like that and dealing with board, the board members and everything. Whereas the admin stuff, he kind of deliberately brought in people to deal with that kind of day-to-day -day tasks and stuff. And, and that was Greta Steinson's role. So obviously that will now pass on to, to Scott Munn. So he's coming straight in there with loads to uh, get his teeth into as well. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Changes behind the scenes. Um, and obviously, in the meantime, Leonardo Gabonini, who I just mentioned earlier, the chief scout, has been taking on a kind of a bigger role in terms of uh, leading a lot of the recruitment staff and, and discussing it all with Daniel Levy at the moment until the next per the new person comes in. Um, but we're going to talk about Gabonini at a little bit more depth later on because I've been kind of doing quite a lot of bit of research into him. He's a bit of a not a hidden figure, but someone that's not too well known. Um, in general, outside football circles. Yeah, that's probably the best way to put it. So we'll talk about him then. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's um, an interesting one. That. It's interesting kind of, uh, and I wonder who else is to go and whether Gavinini ends up, you know, whether there's any kind of issues for him as part of this. It's interesting because the chief scout role, that was pretty sure Steve Hitchin came in as a chief scout and then ended up being a director of football of sorts. Um, and we'll talk a bit later about the possibility of Gabonini maybe getting a promotion, although I think it might come too soon for him. Um, but talking of transfers, we're about to have the first new face, we'll say, because obviously Deki, Dejan Kulusevski, was signed up permanently um, from his loan deal from Juventus. But new face coming in. Looks like they're heading through the door. And that is Guglielmo Vicario. I don't know whether I've murdered the pronunciation there, but hopefully I've got it close enough. Um, if you're not aware, Guglielmo is Italian for William. And William, if you look up the meaning of William, means resolute protector, which is a wonderful description for a goalkeeper of Tottenham Hotspur because he's going to have to do some protecting, a lot of protecting. Um, just on that, thinking about back to the structure. I don't know whether Fabio Paratici has any ambitions or dreams of, of coming back to Tottenham if he were to be able to clear his name I don't know but if he is he's going to walk through that door going eh what's that with all the stuff I did um I don't know whether that'll ever be the case but uh, I just kind of had that vision there of 
of all of the Italians having departed, uh, Greta Steinson having departed. Um, and yeah, we'll see what else happens in that structure. But back to Vicario. Um, looks like that deal is heading towards its conclusion now, which is great. Um, reportedly 19 million euros, which is 16.3 million pounds. Uh, talk that his um, medical will be this weekend, potentially Sunday. Um, and that will all get tied up and Spurs will have their long-term successor to Hugo Lloris, who obviously publicly announced his desire to leave the club after 11 years. Um, so how did we get to Vicario? That's an interesting one because it came out a little bit left field for me. But the more I've done digging since, the more it seems like he was there in the background as part of the shortlist. So I told you before, obviously, we knew about David Raya. Um, uh, Georgi Marmadashvili as well, a Valencia keeper, and Vicario. Apparently, they were the shortlist of the kind of the final three that they'd looking at as a Larice successor. Um, and Vicario, if you're not aware, he's been getting absolutely rave reviews in Serie A this season and also last season as well for Empoli. Uh, only 26 years old, kind of hasn't even hit his prime as a goalkeeper yet. Um, so. Obviously, one of the first things you've got to factor in when you're looking for a Postacoglu goalkeeper is that it needs to be someone who's obviously very good at saving shots, as any goalkeeper has to be. But also, they need to be able to kind of move that ball quickly um, with little re hesitation, really, building up possession from the back very quickly, getting it out to either the defenders or the midfielders. Not really ones for long kicks or big diagonal balls, just very much quickly recycle possession relentless nature of the we never stop Postacoglu motto um so yeah from what I understand having dug around a fair bit this week our old friend Fabio Paratici um was a big admirer of Vicario along with Gabonini um and I actually understand that Paratici inquired about Vicario earlier in the season spoke to those around the goalkeeper to, to just kind of see his availability uh, for this summer and lo and behold, here we are. The Paratici influence still there, clearly. Um, and also Gavinini, uh, someone that would have uh, bigged him up as well. Um, and here we are at this stage. I mean, uh, this is my opinion. This is not to say this is fact. This is just kind of my opinion. I just wonder whether almost... How do I put this? They always had in the back of their mind Vicario would be a very good keeper. And obviously, we'll talk about what he's been doing in Serie A and the massive praise he's been getting as well. But I wonder, whereas as they got to the end of the season, they started to think to themselves, well, you know, David Raya's ready-made. He's there for the now. If we can get him with 12 months left for a good deal, perhaps that's a safer bet right now. So they've gone, obviously, to Brentford and said, so, David Raya, eh? What you got for us? What's the price? And then they've been told £40 million and they've been like yeah, that's not what we were thinking of paying. Um, and obviously, the Spurs' way of hoping that that will go down a bit as maybe other clubs aren't too interested or don't fight for him. Presumably, they just got the sense, OK, that price is not going down. Um, and obviously, it's quite interesting that no one else has made a move for him yet either. You know, obviously been linked with Man U, um, and, and no one's going for that forty million. It's 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 a very interesting figure. Personally, I do think it's an overvaluation for a player with twelve months on his contract. Had he had two or three years left, I can definitely see it because you have to be very clear on this. If anyone signed David Raya for forty million pounds, he would become the fourth most expensive goalkeeper in the history of the game. You know, I think Edison is currently fourth and he was 40 million euros, not pounds. That's about 35, 36 million pounds. Um, yeah, so, well, you can kind of have your own opinion on that. I know the different opinions on it. And I know there's very much a belief of, well, if you wanted him, you should just pay the money. Um, and that's one way of looking at it. Absolutely, it is. And I understand it in certain circumstances. I just always felt that for 40 million, that's a big old whack of money splashed out on a goalkeeper who has only 12 months left on his contract. So presumably, going back to my kind of my opinion, this is not to say this was the case. This is what I think m maybe happened was that all of that 
They went for Raya. Brentford said, no, 40 million. And they went, no, you're all right. And they've walked away and thought, well, let's go back to Vicario because, quite frankly, he ticks so many of the same boxes. Yes, he's not ready-made. He doesn't have the Premier League experience. But ultimately, um, you know, he he can be a big player for the future. And don't get me wrong, we're going to talk about some of so that. Let me let's just get straight into it. Um, so Vicario, so he's been a crucial kind of part. And Empoli got promoted two seasons ago from Serie B. They he has played a major part in essentially keeping them as a mid-table team, not even really flirting with relegation. He's been that good for them. Um, and this is not someone that. Only Spurs have decided, yeah, let's go for that guy. He's crazy, like random transfer. Um, here's a list of the clubs that really have been seriously looking at him in the last year or so. Inter, Juventus, Napoli, Manchester United, Bayern Munich, Brighton. They've all looked at him. Um, and from what I understand, Inter were very seriously had the, the view that if Anana left this season, when obviously Man U very interested in him, they were going to replace Anana with Vicario. Um, and I think that's probably played a big part in Spurs not hanging around and waiting for David Raya um, and the price may be going down. I think they've just looked at it and thought, you know what, Let, let's just go for it in Vicario. For that fee, you know, £16.3 million, pounds, I think you just you get in there and you get the player uh, before Inter get him. And honestly... I didn't know masses about him before. I'd heard the name. I knew who he played for, obviously. But I must admit, I didn't watch loads of Serie A football last season, other than kind of trying to keep an eye on Destiny of Doggy. Um, so my first thing, as you know with me, if I don't know about a subject, I will go away and exhaustively research it and also talk to lots of people who have a first kind of hand account of these people, these things, whatever. So I went to speak to people that cover Serie A and honestly, without fail, every single person I spoke to said Spurs have got one of the deals of the year here. They have got someone who is going to be Italy's next goalkeeping superstar. Um, and that's not me trying to big this up. That's not me trying to do any kind of, woo, he's so amazing. This is what I've been told by other people. Um, is everyone, people that cover, honestly, if you look out there and find a bad review, of Vicario from anyone that covers Italian football, I'd be shocked. Honestly, everything I've seen has been very much glowing about him. I even had one person tell me that, in their opinion, only behind Anana, he had been the second best goalkeeper in Serie A last season. We're talking about the season. I put a tweet out a couple of days ago that some people thought I was saying he was the second best goalkeeper in Italy or Serie A. It's not technically what I meant. I meant his season had been the second best. So, uh, you know, Mike, is it Mannion, the um, Milan keeper, is a wonderful goalkeeper and someone that Spurs have looked at. But technically, he was injured for a big old chunk of the season. Um, and another one that definitely, uh, even Providel, the Lazio keeper, he's another one that had terrific. I think he actually won Serie A goalkeeper of the year. But a couple of these people, no, actually one, to be fair. It was one person that said, in their mind, they felt that Vicario had actually been second best in Serie A for them last season and also was the second best Italian goalkeeper which has kind of been backed up by the fact that in the um he's he's been he's got back into the international team was on the bench for the um Nations League games in the last week uh finals and the view was that he was kind of there as the second uh behind Donnarumma uh, rather than Merritt so yeah it's kind of backed up that to a degree but certainly everyone said Without doubt, he's been one of the best goalkeepers in Italy in the last two years. So he's not some kind of newcomer. He's not some kind of inexperienced, like nobody type whatsoever. That That's not what this uh, signing is at all. Um, I had some more quotes here from you as well. Um, here you are. Gianluca Pagliuca said of Vicario a couple of months ago, it was obviously... Uh, Pagliuca, if you're not aware, is the former Italy, uh, former Inter goalkeeper. He said of him, I've uh, just lost the quote, which I had. Oh, here we are. Vicario is a very good goalkeeper. He will be the most sought-after goalkeeper of the transfer window. If Inter sell Anana for a good price and sign Vicario, that'll be a great deal. He's the goalkeeper I like the most. 
in Serie A and has the right maturity now for the step up. So if you just know those first words in the in the first sentence, he will be the most sought after goalkeeper of the transfer window. And Spurs have got in there first. They've got in there first. They've got the deal pretty much to its conclusion um, and it should be sealed in the coming days. So, yeah, that's not someone to me that's, uh, oh yeah, here's the, the cheap nothing-y replacement just to save a, a bob or two. Um, and I, look, I get where that frustration comes from. It comes from Spurs having done that in the past. I completely understand that. But I don't think you should write off uh, Vicario and and how good you know he's. Actually, there's an, the Italian football podcast. I listened to it yesterday. They do a little. There's a little seven minute uh, segment floating around where they really kind of go in deep on Vicario. It was, was recorded. I think it was recorded this month, or it was very recently, and it gives a really interesting insight into him uh, and how good he, not only how good he is as a player, but also seems like a good guy. Um, apparently, he took in a Ukrainian family um, to well, they were displaced in the war, and he took them into his house and, and has kind of had them living with him, um, which for some reason just reminds me of Kirby enthusiasm and Larry David. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, He's clearly a good guy, Vicario, as well. And look, that's, that's not the, what makes a great player, but it's just a nice little bonus as well. Um, and obviously, when it comes into fitting into his system, uh, Postacoglu system, I understand that Vicario has really been working on his feet in the last couple of years in terms of his passing, his short passing, his long passing. Um, and it's some, an area that you can see a real marked improvement in. I think someone looked at loads of various stats and numbers, and he actually... F- compares very favourably with Ryan and in some some of the categories is better than him. Um so yeah, he's like I say, I get the idea that he will be seen as the cheap option. Absolutely. If if Raya's forty million and he is sixteen point three, it's there. It's there in black and white. It's it's there on paper, whatever you want to say, he is the cheaper option in that respect. But I think I wouldn't dismiss how good this guy can be. Every person I spoke to said his ceiling is so high. He's ready to be your first choice goalkeeper now. And Inter had that in mind as well. And and Bayern um, as well. Um, I think it was in January when Neuer got injured. They were seriously looking at him as well to come in. So there's no fears about him being able to step up and be a top, top level goalkeeper. Um, I think it was, was it against Roma. If you look it up, there's this amazing triple save he makes. The first one is a little bit, he kind of parries it into the area a little bit. But the second and third, he's got incredible reflexes, very acrobatic. He's a big guy, six foot four, but he clearly is very acrobatic uh, goalkeeper as well. Um, yeah, and I was reading plenty of kind of things on him. But that parrying is one thing that probably is something that he still has to get out of his uh, game. He can parry it sometimes into dangerous areas because he feels he has the reflexes maybe to to follow up and save the follow-up shot. Um, but yeah, Mourinho raved about him after that game, said he was absolutely world-class, as Mourinho likes to do to opposition goalkeepers. Um, but that's not to take away from the praise. Gianluca uh, Buffon as well. Um, Buffon definitely has praised him, although there's one quote that I've seen some people using about him being a generational talent and even better than me and all of this. From what I understand, that's a fake quote. Someone was just joking on Twitter and put that out as a laugh. Um, and it just shows how Twitter and social media immediately shove those things out there. Buffon has said lots of good stuff about him and how good a goalkeeper he is. But yeah, the one I think I've seen doing the rounds is not actually a real quote from what I understand. Uh, but yeah, so honestly, I wouldn't... I would definitely, if you want to take this as a cheaper deal, that's absolutely fair because it is a cheaper deal. But please don't write him off as a poor or even average goalkeeper. He's an excellent goalkeeper. If anything, they've got a really good deal from this. Um, Because, yeah, he is going to be a bit of a star. And what's quite interesting, I've seen some people saying this in tweets. This isn't my original idea. Fair play to people that came up with this. And I do agree with it. Is that this includes myself and fans. We've got this thing where we've been saying... In, for a long time, oh, look at the incredible recruitment that Brighton and Brentford and the likes of them do where they, they bring in these people that maybe others haven't heard too much about, but they get them just as they're on the cusp of becoming stars. And then they become stars and everyone goes, oh, why didn't we see him? Why is our club not good enough to scout that person and get them through the door? 
And that's great. And that, that's a great kind of standard for fans to want their club to be like. However, when you then have this scenario, and I know this is kind of beaten into Spurs fans because of the past, but when you have this scenario where you kind of want the big money signing over the one who everyone is raving about and is a real talent who clearly could be one of the... Well, Brighton looks at him. He could be that Brighton-Brentford-type signing, but able to play at a higher level than even that because Inter and Bayern Munich were looking at him, and, and Man U have seriously looked at him as well. I think you then have to balance it up and say, OK, maybe this is one of these signings we've actually been calling for. Um, but I understand it. I understand the frustration. I know where it comes from. I know the place that it comes from. Um, and I understand that there's this feeling that this is the uh, the, the, the cheap... Um, it's seen as the cheap option um, when it was as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's... Um, I think it's it's a good... I mean, look, I know we shouldn't be concerned about the finances, but just if you were looking at it in that sense, Guesty was, did a piece on this earlier where he looked at it, and if you look at... They've saved about £4 million on the Kulusevsky deal, which they renegotiated and got down. And technically, they've not paid £40 million for Ryan. Instead, they've gone for a 16.3. I think Guesty worked it out as something, well, well, that's... If you were prepared... If, it's a, it's a little awkward one because you have to then assume that they would have paid forty million for Raya, which clearly they weren't with Vicario there as an option. But if you were to take that logic, you would say maybe say that to the people who wanted them to spend, because there were people that were even saying just pay the full amount for Gurusevsky. So technically, they've saved I think it's twenty eight million on those two deals where they didn't go all out. And look, I know, I absolutely, I know I can actually feel some people cringing there because they're probably thinking, but you shouldn't be looking to save 28 million. You should be going out and just paying what is needed. But let's say they get, they can put that 28 million towards James Madison. Let's say they put that towards a top centre-back. And then, you know, Vicario is a success, which we hope he'll be. Kulisevsky is massive next season as well. Then maybe we all look back on it and say, "Crikey, they got an absolute bargain with Vicario. What a player! Oh, you know what a bargain Kulusevski was for that reduced price." And obviously, then they were able to put even more money towards getting player A and B and or Madison or whatever. And wow, what a what a transfer window! It could go the other way, and everyone could just moan uh, that they didn't pay the money, and and it could be a disaster. But and I will always say this about Spurs: whenever they've paid their biggest money, it's quite often gone wrong. You look at Ondembele, you look at the Celso, even Sanchez, obviously very successful at the time, club record signing, but obviously over the years has not proved um, to be kind of worthy of that money, I guess. Sissoko is another one, mixed time. Uh, Richarlison, 60 million last summer. Technically, and he admits this himself, has not achieved the levels he, he should be achieving for that sort of money. So I, I kind of, the rule with Spurs almost is if they, the ones that they splash out the big money on actually aren't the ones that are the biggest successes. So I know we want them to be ambitious and want them to pay the the, the money required to get the, the very good players, but maybe it's about getting the right players rather than the top players, if you see what I mean. And maybe this has always been Spurs' issue, along with a lot of other ones, admittedly. Um, but yeah, yeah. So, so Vicario... He will be heading through that door. Hopefully that will all be tied up soon. It'll be interesting to see what happens with the Lloris situation and whether that now can be accelerated um, and whatever he wants to do next, uh, I guess, when... Because um, I, I, st I still... I, I, to be honest, because the thing is, I don't think Hugo is represented by anyone. I don't think so. So there's less of a a circle of kind of information that can go out there that's that's the thing so often a lot of players will have a like a, a manager an agent they'll have family members whatever various people that will kind of you can feel the information comes out or some different whatever way it comes out but with Larice, he's a little bit like Potts. So i think i think he represents himself unless i'm completely wrong and i'm mixing up with someone else i feel like he does so kind of we're almost waiting to see who comes in for him we know he'd like to go to Nice uh, eventually at some point and finish his career, but there are other French clubs, I think, that are seriously looking at him. Um, I do wonder whether any of the Saudi teams are looking at 
him as well as a as a top kind of level top well known World Cup winning goalkeeper um, MLS maybe um, but we'll find out either way the kind of point I was trying to make before I went off on that tangent was that he is the re- re- the replacement there and Forster there as well. Larice now can be allowed to move on to his next challenge adventure. What it is, um, I know he's got a year left. I would be surprised if Spurs are desperately holding out for a fee for him after eleven years of service. You never know, but I would maybe imagine because of how big his wages are, he would be someone that they would just say, "Okay, we'll let you go to get you off the wage bill." It maybe might not be, but that would be my kind of opinion on what I would have thought would happen. Um, there was a part of me that wondered, well, could they get Vicario and Raya? Um, but I think that would just be probably mad, wouldn't it, to, to spend, you know, almost, if they were to pay the top dollar, you know, almost approaching £60 million for two goalkeepers. When you've got Forster, who I think will be a very serviceable backup for Postacoglu if he wants to keep him. I know he's technically doesn't fit the Postacoglu mould of a goalkeeper, kind of be able to rush out as a bit of a sweeper keeper, but to be honest... Neither's really Joe Hart, and Joe Hart was kind of very successful under him at Celtic. Um, I know a different kind of football, uh, sorry, a different level technically of football to what Spurs aiming to be playing at. Um, but still, I think uh, Forster will be absolutely fine. So yeah, Vicario, uh, we shall see. Um, hopefully, not the next Gallini. Uh, with no disrespect to Pierre Luigi Gallini, but he was not what. To be fair, I was going to say not what it was billed to be, but to actually, I don't remember at the time the same amount of praise and just general, wow, what a great deal was coming for Galini as it is for Vicario. With Galini, everyone said, no, no, he's got the potential. He's a, he's a good keeper. Um, he was kind of on and off the number one at Atalanta before he came on loan. But certainly I know that Paratici and Nuno Espirito Santo were very clear around the club that Galini was going to swiftly become the number one. And obviously it didn't prove to be that case, that way. He was a little bit erratic. Um, and yeah, he's kind of even his career since. He's at Napoli. He's kind of second choice, occasionally third there. Obviously he's won the Scudetto with them because he's been at that club. But it hasn't kind of gone there and become the first choice goalkeeper at all. Um yeah, it, it's it's an interesting one with Galini. Um, you know, Vicario will have his moments as a younger keeper. All goalkeepers have their moments. He There's going to be moments when he has a kind of a rush of blood to the head where he does something a little bit daft. And as you're the last man, the last line of defence, it's going to all go a bit pear-shaped if you mess it up. But certainly, yeah, the buzz around him is... It's incomparable to Galini. Galini was just seen as a as a good keeper... Potentially could challenge Larice. We'll see what happens. Vicario is very much people saying, "Okay, you've got your new goalkeeper for the next ten, eleven years locked up there or locked down there, not locked up." <laughs> That'd be weird. Um, so yeah, I don't get the impression that this is the similar kind of deal. There's more of a feel feeling of wow, you've Spurs have actually stolen a march on all the people that would have looked to sign him had their goalkeepers moved on this summer. So uh, yeah, we shall see. We shall see what comes of him um, and hopefully get to talk to him on the tour. I don't know what his English is like. Um, I feel like I read somewhere that his English is okay. Hopefully it is. Uh, We'll swiftly find out because he'll probably do some kind of uh, uh, announcement video. Um, I don't think he would join up with it. It depends. Technically, I think by the FIFA kind of guidance international players are not expected back at Spurs until July the 12th. Obviously, he didn't play any minutes, so that may be a different thing. He may be allowed, if he wants to kind of make an early impression and get there early, um, he may come a bit earlier, as a few of those international players might this summer. But, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how he plays. It's, again, I get the sentiment about him being the cheaper option, but please don't undervalue how good an option he could be. Larice, when he came, I know he'd, he'd played in a Champions League quarter final, was it? He? He'd certainly gone far in a Champions League with Leon, but by all means, he didn't come in there and immediately be the sensation or the, the long. Everyone wouldn't didn't think, oh, here's the goalkeeper for the next ten, eleven years. I think he was back up to Brad Friedel at the start of his first season. I think it took him a little while as well. Um, but yeah, 
we'll see what happens with Vicaro, but I do think he's quite a talent. Um, so yeah, I was going to talk about Leonardo Gavinini because he's a fascinating character behind the scenes. Although at the moment behind the scenes, things are changing so much. Who knows if he'll be there in a month or two's time. But I just thought it was quite an interesting one to talk to you about. Because I've got loads of kind of snippets and, and kind of bits of info on him and things like that. And then just to help you understand this guy who is kind of a big major piece of Spurs transfer dealings this summer and what's going to happen in the absence of official absence of Paratici with his resignation um, and no director of football type there yet. So, Gabonini, um 43 years old, brought in last July by Paratici to find essentially the best buyers for the Conte system. Uh, now he's going to have to very much uh, find the best buyers for the Postacoglu system and run them by him for him to approve. Um, Florence born. I love Florence. Beautiful place. Um, I don't know why I said that. It's of no consequence whatsoever. This is a really nice place. Um, and yeah, he is the chief scout, but obviously with everything that's happened, he's really risen in prominence and he is now it's in daily dialogue with Daniel Levy, from what I understand as well. Um, he was in that meeting I told you about with Postacoglu um, earlier this month when he popped into Hotspur Way, talking about transfers with Levy there, Ryan Mason there as well. Um, and look, there's this kind of view I think some people have got that Postacoglu, it's, it's the same kind of idea. If Postacoglu will only know about Australian and Asian, maybe specifically Japanese players, which is not the case at all. You'd be wrong to think that. From what I've told, he's got a real encyclopedic knowledge of European football as well and, and, and world football, and he knows so many players. And the same can be said about Gabonini. If you're thinking that he is just someone that will dip into the Italian market, that's not the case at all. So if you're not aware of Gabonini's uh, background, he was high up in the um, Pozzo scouting network. They're the family that owned, uh, or owned uh, Udinese and Watford, and he played a big part within their set up um he actually with Watford he headed up their domestic UK network so he's very knowledgeable on the UK market and some people I spoke to said that he's got a great knowledge of the South American market as well so he's a he's a guy with a lot of great connections and he's also a very modern day kind of scout in that he uses a lot of data as well um so he will trust his eyes as all scouts do but he also will heavily back it up with data so they can get the best possible player to fit the manager, um, whoever they're kind of supplying the players for. And from my understanding, because of his data um, expertise, Paratici would lean on him quite heavily for that. I think Paratici maybe was more of a, uh, a hunch, a sense kind of guy, a feeling kind of guy, maybe a bit more old school. Um, and he would lean on um, Gabonini for his use of, of data. And also Lorenzo Gianni, who's another kind of behind-the-scenes guy who was brought in by Paratici as his title. I've written it down here, Consultant International Football Scout. I'm not entirely sure whether Gianni's still there. He, I think, was working from Italy rather than um, from England. Um, I wonder whether with Parat he would have gone with Paratici or not. I'll have to check that one out. But... Um, yeah, but as for Gabonini, he's a very direct guy. He is not one to sit on the fence. If you ask him about a player, he will go away, form a very quick opinion, look at all the data and trust his own reports or reports from the team of scouts he's assembled, and he will give you a very firm opinion on him. Um, he will, of course, turn to the Italian market at times. Of course, he's going to know that well, and that's why you're you're getting someone like Vicario. Um but, you know, he's also, he's quite a kind of a, a broad spectrum of what he kind of looks for as well and looks at the age groups as well, because he used to be uh, a, a kind of an academy coach as well himself. Um, at both se He was actually a coach at senior and youth level. Um, so he will look at the complete player. That's the key thing for him. As, as a former coach, he looks at not only their talent, but he also looks at uh, their mental aspect of it, how they adapt, their work rate. Uh, how they'll fit into another culture, a country, a squad. Um, and that's, I think all of those attributes are going to help him as he and Postacoglu kind of plot which players they want to, to flesh out his squad. Um, so he was originally brought into Spurs to kind of expand and improve the scouting network at Spurs. 
Um, and he's a guy that, from what I understand, really expects high standards from all of those who works uh, around him or for him. A bit like practically a bit of a workaholic, would work incredibly long hours. Um, and yeah, he'd expect any reports that come into him from his scouts to be absolutely top level. Every bit of info you could possibly want from it. Um, nothing left to kind of chance, really. Um, yeah, he's a very... How do I put this? A very direct talker, very passionate man. Um, in this way he talks, I don't know how passionate he is as in other aspects of his life, but in, in certainly in the way he talks, um, very direct, doesn't mince his words. Um, and from what I understand, that doesn't always go down well with everyone. I think he has rubbed some people up the wrong way. Uh, some people who will say, well, he's just a, a character. That's just kind of how he is. Other people have claimed that I've spoken to that maybe it comes across as a little bit of an arrogance that he has as well. But often a lot of the people that are very good at their jobs kind of have that that arrogance about them. Maybe it's, uh, you know, like I say, some people just say it's just, just part of his character and, and the way he is and, and his, um, and just, yeah, the way he has about him. Um, he's not afraid to make a decision and, and certainly I know you've probably heard me speak about this before but the way he um, improved or looked to improve Spurs academy scouting structure certainly caused some issues and a, a cluttering of the structure lower down the levels at Spurs in that uh, Paratici and Hitchin had previously brought in Chris Perkins to head up a, new, a unit called the Emerging Talent uh, Scouting uh, Unit. So I had Chris Perkins who'd come in from Everton. You had people like Chris Scudder who'd come in from uh, West Ham as an Emerging Talent Scout. And they were responsible for people like uh, Will Lankshire. You've got Herbie James coming in this summer as well. Uh, quite a few of these kind of talented young players they were trying to bring in with a little bit of an increased... Uh, wage structure in the academy but what they swiftly found out with Gabonini was that Gabonini was bringing in his youth scouts and suddenly everyone was all kind of on top of each other and the structure wasn't working particularly well and it's no coincidence that Chris Perkins left in February to head to Arsenal as their head of emerging talent uh, Chris Scudder has last month I think it was or actually it might be this month joined Wolves as their head of London recruitment so clearly it didn't quite work as a, as a kind of thing that meshed together too many cooks in the kitchen as it were um yeah so Gabonini he looks at signings at all levels youth levels senior levels um and as I said the, the academy aspect comes from his years spent as a coach in the youth setups at Sampdoria and Fiorentina uh at Fiorentina he later became the head of academy coaching as well uh, before he left for the Pozzo family and the Watford and Udinese work. So he is a guy that, like I say, has an all-round view when he signs or looks or recommends players to be signed. So you'd think his knowledge and um, Postacoglu's knowledge put together would be quite an interesting um, combo. Because this is the thing when people say, oh, but, you know, there's going to be this void now of who's going to know who to sign. That's where Gabonini comes in, very much so. Um, yeah, he's very well connected. Um, from what I've told by people that kind of worked with him, he's got this preference of dealing directly with agents um, of players rather than a lot of times in football you'll hear of intermediaries and they're the people that will broker deals between a club and another agent on behalf of the club. Um, that's just a way it happens in football quite a lot. But with... Gabonini, he's a guy that likes to go direct to the source. He'll go to the agent of a player. He's, he's a very well-connected guy. And actually, it's because of that, there's quite a few people that work with him over recent years have actually feel that he's got the potential to become a director of football himself, which is what I was kind of hinted at earlier. Could, could he potentially be someone that gets promoted and steps up into that role at Spurs? My gut tells me maybe it's too early. Uh, maybe he... The club are looking for someone with a little bit more experience, perhaps. Um, you know, I know he's 43, so he's, and some of the candidates we've we've heard about have been younger than that, but I guess an experience of having already been a director of football um, type. I'm going to have to keep saying that because I do think that title is going to be different. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see who fills that gap between Postacoglu and Scott Munn. 
and what happens with Gabonini? Because from my understanding, there's a lot of clubs looking at Gabonini. He, he's a he's a wanted man because of his abilities and his network as well and his, his scouts that he employs. Um, so yeah, keep an eye on what happens there. If there is another director of football type brought in, and Gabonini kind of feels overlooked or feels that he doesn't quite fit with the new director of football it will not be long before someone comes in for him. I think Lazio were kind of sniffing around him recently as well. Um, so, yeah, actually, I've got a little quote from him somewhere here. Let's have a look. Um, oh, yeah, here we are. He gave a little interview. Because I should stress, Gavinini is so behind the scenes that when I wrote an article about him uh, yesterday, I couldn't even get a photo of him. There's a couple that exist on Google, but in terms of the massive company I work for, um, that have access to so many different photos from various photo agencies, there wasn't actually any available of him. I ended up having to use, I think I might have even used the photo of Daniel Levy, just because, or Paratic, I can't remember who I used. Um, but there is actually some quotes from him. In October last year, he gave an interview to Radio Forenze Viola, in which he said, <clears throat> it's going well in England. It's a completely different reality. I've been working there for five years now. Before I was at Watford as Chief Scout. Now it's a different world at Tottenham. There's a very high value in everything you do. In short, it's tough, but it also gives you satisfaction. The key this summer, of course, for him, really, when it comes to satisfaction, is for Postacoglu. It's, it's so important for him that um, this has been a massive thing for Spurs over the years, has been... Signing players because they wanted to sign the players and essentially the manager approving them. Whereas what this could be the massive difference between success and failure, really, for Postacoglu. Give him the right players, he will absolutely flourish. Give him the wrong pieces for his jigsaw puzzle, and of course he's going to struggle. And that is something Spurs have to have learned from some of the previous managers and who they've bought. They've... Been, this is the, a massive issue of being a club with such a messed up identity or lack of clear identity and, and direction is that as a club, you look at someone like Jed Spence and you think, oh, what a terrific young attacking player, really exciting. Oh, we can see how good he's going to be. But you sign in for someone like Antonio Conte, who you've brought in and know has a very different view on things. Um, and so that didn't work. Um, and even someone like Basuma was brought in and clearly is one was has was one of the best Premier League midfielders for Brighton, but has come in into a very different kind of rigid system with all about repetition with Conte and struggled under Conte. And in shock horror, Ryan Mason has a few games with him and we see a kind of more Basuma of old. And that's not to say that Conte's a bad coach or anything like that, but it just shows that different players under different coaches are completely different players. Um you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's what Gabonini has to make sure that he is out of any mindset of buying players for even Spurs, let alone a previous manager. He has to be buying players for Postacoglu. Look, it was, it was all done with a good intention with Conte. I know that uh, Paratici felt that Jed Spence would be perfect for the Conte system, but unfortunately, I just don't think Conte ever believed that. Um, and that's the key: is that Postacoglu shouldn't have to be convinced about anyone unless it is it is definitely a player that he hasn't heard enough about and wants to be informed about them. He kind of has to be shown the options, at the, the list and who is gettable and then let him make the decision from those options. That's the kind of the, the way you have to go about it, really, to, to be any success. So, uh, yeah, so that's good. Gabonini. Sorry if that was a bit boring for anyone, but I just thought it was quite interesting. He's a guy that we haven't known too much about and I was just able to get a, a fair whack of information about him um in the last you know few days so yeah just know a little bit more about him now obviously the way Spurs are it may be utterly redundant within about a week or two but hopefully he's someone that sticks around for long term because I do hear good things about him um but the same was about same about Greta Steinson as well certainly I think he was quite popular among a lot of the uh, people within the academy um, and obviously I think has been a big help in getting some of these kind of deals done for the younger players in the last couple of weeks, making sure a few of them stayed. Um, so, yeah, I think there will be a few that miss him. I think um, he's an interesting chap. I 
well, I spoke to him at Academy Game once, and I actually strangely spoke to him at the kit launch a couple of weeks ago because he was turned up. He's when I talk about a direct talker, he's very much like that uh, Greta Steinson. Very, I think it's maybe his Icelandic way. Um, very to the point, very direct. Um, but yeah, an interesting guy. I kind of sat down and and just had a chat about just football in general, really. And uh, yeah, obviously wish him the very best and wherever he goes next. But um, yeah, and he did. He did make an impact at Spurs. It's just the way Spurs is right now that no one seems to last very long. And it's it's not a good look for a company, this high staff turnover, whether it is staff leaving of their own accord or whether it's Spurs making decisions to change structures and everything. It's not a good look. I mean, I've had four managers in the last four months or so, for goodness sake. <sighs> so there you go. What else have we got to tidy up from these last few days? Sonny. Sonny, Yes. Sonny, you'll have seen, was linked with a £50 million bid to join the Saudi exodus. That was the word I was searching for last week. Thank you very much for everyone that put that underneath the video. Um, Al Itihad, um, £50 million. They're the one, the side that uh, bought Karim Benzema. Um, I think they're the ones that got Angolo Kante as well. Um, Conte, technically, I think if I say it. Um, obviously we know what's happening with the, the Saudi top Saudi clubs are all trying to bring in some of the best players in Europe and they're not even like going for it's not like a retirement home thing they're going for younger players like Ruben Nevers as well it's a proper attempt to uh, make their league into uh, I guess the next Premier League is probably what they're trying to do with it um, so obviously Sonny's name came up um, from what I understand Spurs were never going to be open to it anyway whatsoever um, first off, first and foremost, Sonny is an incredible talent. I think will be may amazing. I don't know what word I was going to go for? Marvelous, amazing under Postacoglu. I think he will bring the very best back out of him again. Um, but even if you're looking at, if you're going to be completely cynical, you know he's such an incredible, marketable guy as well. He is, you know, people have referred to him as the Beckham of Asia. For Spurs, fifty million. You know, I don't know the figures of how much they make from just having Sonny as a player because of how incredibly popular he is. But I'd imagine it's probably not worth that amount from what you're going to get over the coming years. Um, but I should stress that's a very cynical way of looking at it. The best way to look at it is just he's one of the best players in Europe. He really is, if not the world, especially when he's on song, and he will be this season. I believe that. Um, but he actually spoke about it. Sung Mo Lee, the um, excellent uh, Korean football reporter that you'll have heard me spoke about before. And obviously we had a, a great time out in uh, South Korea last summer as he showed me uh, his homeland and, and all the wonderful things about it and the wonderful people. He, Sung Mo, got, grabbed these quotes from Sonny Spoke after uh, on international duty. He was asked about the Saudi links and... It's actually interesting. If you watch the video, he lets out a big sigh before he answers the question. He's clearly quite dismissive of it. And these are the quotes he said. I have many things to do in the Premier League. Money doesn't matter to me now. And the pride of playing football to play in my favourite league is important. I want to play more for Tottenham in the Premier League. I'll prepare well when I'm back to Spurs. You can't ask for more than that. That's exactly what you want to hear from one of your top players coming out and quite clearly saying... Nope, got plenty more to do at Spurs. Thank you very much. It's lovely to hear. Um, and you'd expect no less from Sonny because he's that kind of guy. Um, so that's that. We can put that in the draw mark. No, thank you very much. Uh, what else have we got? Under-21s had a result. Um, they've escaped relegation. If you missed my little piece on that in the week. Um, yeah, Spurs under-21s. So they had a bit of a mare last season in terms of they had a lot of how do I put this? Issues and injury problems as well. Um, issues with availability and the way Conte would use under-21 players for training sessions. Not always in the most mobile way. If you've read my stuff and listened to these previously, you'll know what I mean. So for the first half of the last season, the under-21s really struggled in the Premier League too. Um, but then, once they started to kind of overcome that, they were really good in 2023. This year, this calendar year, they've only lost three games out of all of their fixtures in the Premier League too. And unfortunately, damage had been done in those early uh, months 
and they ended up getting relegated on the final day as the second from bottom team. They beat West Ham 1-0, but unfortunately did not stay up. Um, they did have a lot of injuries. There's like poor old Jamie Donnelly, who's a very talented player. He essentially was pretty much playing everywhere, uh, just sort of trying to fill him in anywhere. It shows his versatility. He was constantly... Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, here, there, and everywhere for, for Spurs under 21s, and also playing for the under 18s and under 17s as well. Um, but anyway, it's all history now, the relegation, because Spurs benefited, and we know the history of Spurs. They haven't always benefited from league shakeups, but for their under 21s, they have benefited. They will no longer be relegated, and that is because I was it had the Premier League confirmed to me that there was a vote in the AGM last week. Uh, to absolutely revolutionise, revamp Premier League 2. So rather than dropping down to a lower division, it will now just be a single tier 25 team league. Huzzah! (laughs) Great news for Spurs who escaped relegation. Um, Poor old Wayne Burnett, uh, the under-21s manager, was probably going to have a relegation on his CV and now he doesn't have to have it on there, which is great for him and all those players. Um, so yeah, this new system is going to be all the 25 category one academies will field an under 21 team, um, in this league. And the reason it's come about is because there were concerns among clubs about how little the original system was actually preparing players for first team football, because there was a feeling that some clubs were almost building, um, an under 21 squad to try and preserve their league position. And it became more about the results than it did individual development of the players and making sure they were ready for the first team. Uh, And some clubs were almost stockpiling young players just for these under-21 competitions. Um, So, yeah, they they wanted the focus to be back on coaching and development rather than results. Uh, So they developed, uh, they, sorry, adopted this Swiss model, it's called, which comes from chess. And it's actually going to be used in the Champions League. Uh, in the 20, from the 2024-25 season onwards. Um, essentially what it is, is you'll see the 25 Premier League 2 teams will now be seeded into five pots based on their historical performance in the competition over the three years previously, which means each team will play 20 matches in the regular season, which is six less, sorry, six fewer than Spurs were playing in uh, Division 1. But actually it would have been the same that they would have played in Division 2 had they dropped down. Each team will play all the clubs in their own pot, plus four or five teams in all other pots, which means they get a wider spread of opposition. Um, and yeah, the resulting combined table will determine playoff positions. And then the top 16 teams will go on, qualify for knockout stages. And then, yeah, you get the excitement of knockout football as well, um, which, like I say, is what we're going to see in the Champions League in a couple of years' time. So, yeah. Yeah, that's good news for the under-21s. More good news for the under-21s from what I understood the last time I looked into the situation, which was was it yesterday, a couple of days ago, is that Matthew Craig looks like he is going to sign his new deal to stay at the club. Well, certainly they're getting closer to getting an agreement. If you're not aware, Matthew Craig played mainly as a defensive midfielder last season. He was very versatile. He can play as a fullback. He can play as a centre-back. Only 20 years old. He's been on the bench for the first team quite a lot I look back maybe maybe 10 times over the last couple of seasons Um, and probably one of the best players for Spurs under 21s last season um, without a shadow of a doubt actually so that's great news for Spurs they get him tied down obviously coming hot on the heels of Mikey Moores uh, looks like he's going to be at the club for the foreseeable future which is great he's only 15 but he's an incredible talent um As long as he keeps his head down and works hard, he is going to be some player. Um, I'm intrigued to see how quickly they accelerate his development with first-team training sessions, of which he's already had a few, um, because you've really such a difficult balance when they're that kind of age of don't stunt their development by pushing them too quickly, but also, if they're good enough, get them in and around these top players to kind of get used to it. Um, So, yeah, yeah. Two, uh, two good little bits of news there for the academy. I think with Niall John, we're still waiting to find out which way that's going to go. Um, he, like uh, Matthew Craig, was offered a new contract. Just got to see what he is. Obviously, a midfielder, if you're not aware, Niall John is. Um, I 
think he is certainly was 19. He might be 20 now. Um, he's a good player as well. Very good player. Um, been a bit of interest in him from clubs in Europe over the last year or so. Um, and now he's just got to make a decision on what comes next for him. Obviously, Romain Mundell was the other one who was offered a contract but decided to head off elsewhere. And we shall see where he goes. Um, obviously, Yaya Torre has gone off as well um, this week, which is it's a difficult one. It, it, it's a shame um, because he obviously was doing really good things, uh, really good things for the club in their... Um, sorry, I was just looking up on Yaya because I want to get his age. Because I was about to say what a young coach he is. And relatively, he is... He is... Let me get this right. He is 40 years old. 40 years old now, Yaya Toure. Um, so, yeah, he's gone to standard Liège. Uh, this week uh, to be the assistant manager there which is a great move for him he's been working his way kind of through the uh, at Spurs as under 16s he's been working with and it's made an impact the style of play under him has been terrific uh, a lot of players really feel like you know he, he's made an impact on them I know there were some people that wanted to see him as part of Postacoglu's coaching staff and things like that but yeah I think yeah, his career is obviously going in a slightly different direction at the moment. Um, and maybe, we don't know. We don't know whether he was ready for that step up in the Premier League yet or whether he needs to kind of go to the Belgium League first. Uh, but actually, the reason it kind of went back in my head is Romain Mundell, I think, was linked with Liège as well. So, yeah, interesting to see whether um, he can end up not reuniting because obviously... Romain Mundo, I think, is 19, 20. So, yeah, he wasn't being coached by Yaya Toure, but certainly will be very well aware of him around the academy setup. Um, so, yeah. yeah, best of luck to Yaya Toure, who was very well liked and seemed a thoroughly nice chap um, and obviously a talented coach as well. So, uh, yeah, what else we got? Pre-season, like I say, that is coming hot on our heels now it is first team of july the first and second they're meant to start coming back uh, obviously postacoglu's first day is the first under 21s i think are coming back a few days before that international players like i said earlier july the 12th is the date that they're going to be coming back from um we shall see which ones decide to come back a little bit earlier if they're allowed to um i think sonny from what I understand, at this moment, this may be subject to change. At the moment, I think he might be linking up with Spurs in Australia. Um, purely because, if you look at that, coming back on the 12th for internationals, I think Spurs maybe even fly out on the 14th. So it's such a quick turnaround. Um, so for Sonny to come all the way back from South Korea to then go all the way back out to Australia, probably not good for his body um, or his mind to be on... You know, two long haul flights. Having flown to Korea, you know that's that's a long flight, and then going to Australia, you know, you're looking at twenty two hours without um, if you're not connecting. Um, so I think the plan. I think I was looking it up. Korea to Perth is about twelve twelve and a half hour flight. So it makes more sense really for Sonny just to come on and link up with the team in Australia on the fifteenth, sixteenth, whenever they land. <clears throat> and yeah, um, so I think that's mostly it with the the, the pre season as well. It'll be in, that's when we'll we'll suddenly have so much more to talk about with Postacoglu. It almost feels like it's kind of Postacoglu has been appointed. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I'm doing my voice uh, to pieces here. It feels like almost Postacoglu has now just drifted back into the background because he's kind of been on holiday. Um, whether he rocks up at Hospital Way ahead of the first, we'll see maybe he does but that is officially his first day to start um obviously popped in a couple of weeks back so there's nothing to st uh, suggest he won't do that again but certainly officially we shall see him there from that saturday july the first which as i said i think in the last video that's a couple of days earlier than normal you often see the players come back on the first monday of july which would be the third in this case but seems like they're they're coming back that little bit earlier to get to work on the postacog glue system you know, without the international players, it's going to be very much a um, 
I would say a skeleton crew, but it's going to be uh, a lot of players that I've got. I think I had a list here. Let me see if I can uh, read those out to you. No, I've got rid of it. Of course I would have. Of course I would have got rid of anything that's of any use. Um, but yeah, he'll have... Oh, I'm, I'm going to look it up here. Here we go. I've got it. Right. Here's the list of players that should be back at the start. So we've got uh, Eve Basuma, Eric Dyer, Pedro Porro, Emerson Royale, Jed Spence, uh, Brian Hill, um, Ryan Sessignon, who should be fit, I'm told, Fraser Forster, Japit Tanganga, Harvey White, Brandon Austin, Alfie White, and then, of course, any of the lone players as well who are coming back. Um, so there's a fair whack there to work with and throw in a couple of under-21s there as well. Um, I don't know whether... I'm trying to think well, Alfie Devine was on international duty, but that was a little bit earlier. Alfie Devine, you'd think, could be able to get involved. Alfie Dorrington as well. Um, Maxim, Maxim Pacozzi. I'm trying to think if he was in international duty with Estonia or not. He might have been. Um, but there'll certainly be some young players that you can have a real look at as well. Like Dane Scarlett. Troy Parrott was on international duty with Ireland, so he would be part of that 12th of July group. But again, if I'm Troy Parrott and you're allowed to come back early, you'd probably be looking to do so because I know he really wants to make an impression. Jed Spence is the same. I know he really wants to make an impression on Postacoglu and try and earn his place in his squad. So, yeah, there's enough there to work with. Um, obviously, you're missing a fair few of the kind of the major international stars, of course. But, you know, even someone like Basuma getting used to that system, that's massive. Porro, Emerson and Jed, like I said. Uh, and Brian Hill, massive for him as well. And even Ryan Session, just for confidence. And Eric Dyer, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with Eric Dyer. Um, we shall see. This transfer window is going to be fascinating because, mainly for me, because there's going to be even more of an emphasis on getting players out of the club this summer. Because, you know, I've said this before, it's hampered their efforts in the past. They wanted to sign two centre-backs, for example, in the last two summer windows. They couldn't because they couldn't get the centre-backs out of the door. So who they bring in this summer is going to be... that They need to make their plans work. They need to be better at getting players out of the door. And it may just be essentially Daniel Levy, I guess, as the man in charge of the money at the end of the day, just, you know, taking some fees that he wouldn't normally take, just purely to get them out of the club and off the wage bill. Um I still don't think, I know, you know, I see people say, oh, you know, you've got to get rid of Dyer, Sanchez, Tanganga, and you've got Joe Roden, obviously, as well, who probably could do with regular football. If you lose all of those players, and Longley's gone at the moment, you only got Christian Romero left. <laughs> you can't really, I, I'd be stunned if every single centre-back bar Romero left the club. That would seem a huge overhaul. I do think... With a new manager, as always, you're probably going to have a couple of transfer windows of phasing out the old squad and changing it to the new squad. I think it's just naturally the way. Unless you're Nottingham Forest and you sign 24 players in a window, whatever it was, you're probably not going to have such a massive overhaul. And to be honest, having a massive overhaul actually isn't always the great thing because sometimes it's too much of a, a change too suddenly. Uh, it's too much to try to, um, yeah, alter and tweak and, and, and move about. But, you know, Postacoglu is a forceful man. He's a, he's a guy that has a very set idea of what he wants. And I think it'll be very clear if you're not, if your name's not on the list, you ain't getting in, essentially. If you're not a player that he feels will fit his system, it'll be made very clear, okay, you can move them on. And it'll be down to Spurs to move them on. I might have said this before, I'm sure we'll have a list ahead of the preseason tour of players who have going off uh, looking for other opportunities and challenges for themselves. Um, because he'll know pretty quickly which players will have the stomach for what he wants, will have the mental aptitude for what he wants, and also just fit what he wants. So that's good. You, you want a guy with a very clear vision um, who's not willing to compromise on players as well. And this is what makes me chuckle when people maybe suggest that Postacoglu will be a yes man for anything the club want. He will not. Don't get me wrong. He's going to be. He's very excited about being Spurs boss, 
and it was a wonderful moment for him and a real kind of crowning achievement in his career thus far. But if you think he's going to accept what he's given, absolutely not. He is a guy that knows that his system only works if it's got the right cogs in the machine. So he knows he will be judged on what he produces. So he has to be able to produce what he can with the right people involved. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. Like I said before, the priority five positions are a goalkeeper, which Vicario is, is going to be that first piece. Um, two centre-backs, a central attacking midfielder who can either play in a 4-3-3 or a 4-2-3-1, and a preferably young winger. You know, you're looking at probably someone under 23, 24 uh, to come in. That may change, you know, if this is the other thing about the transfer window is that it's all about opportunity. So when I say young winger, that's the idea. And like with the centre-backs, the idea is maybe to have one young one and one experienced one. The market often dictates that. You can have a very set idea of who you want, who the data tells you should go for, an idea of who the manager wants. Sometimes those players aren't attainable. Sometimes it's cost. Sometimes because the player doesn't want to move, like we had with uh, Bastoni last summer, just did not want to leave Inter. And, you know, it's about being able to kind of get around that and, and, and look for other opportunities. And sometimes another opportunity may be an older winger. It may be that, like I say, Spurs aren't a priority right now is, is not a, a fullback and it's not another striker. But it may be that they find a hybrid of a, a young winger, a young winger, a young, not a Kevin Wimmer, a young winger who can play as a striker. Slap bang, you've got someone that actually is versatile enough to do you in a couple of positions there. Um, and the same with a fullback. You may find that a big offer comes in for a fullback that you weren't looking to move on. Suddenly, you think, OK, well, actually, let's take that because we've got this idea for this other fullback who was on our list in case we needed a fullback. Bang, let's bring him in. So, yeah, they're the five positions of note that they want. Technically, it's four positions because there's two in one. Um, centre back, they're looking for someone that can play on the left, someone on the right. Ideally, a left side uh, footed centre back for the left role, but it's not essential as long as it's someone that can play in that left uh, sided role of the central two, the central duo. Um, and obviously, we know James Madison is a is a massive kind of um, candidate for the the midfield role. Um, I'm also intrigued to actually on Madison first. Obviously, Tonali going to Newcastle is an interesting piece of that whole uh, pattern because although Tonali is a different player, uh, obviously a different player, different kind of player, uh, defensive midfielder who actually, you know, against Milan in the Champions League, you know, Pape had a very good night against Tonali. Actually, it's, it's quite interesting there. He's, he's a very good player. Don't get me wrong; I'm not doing him down. I'm just saying, Pape Matasar clearly a player. That hopefully, he's going to get a lot more opportunities under Postecoglou this season. But with Newcastle splashing out 70 million or so on um, Tonali, you know, there seems to be a sense around the Newcastle journals that maybe they don't go for Madison now. Um, there was some indication, I think one reporter around the Newcastle area was was suggesting that maybe financial fair play-wise, it might put them in a bit of trouble if they went for someone like Madison, who's being touted as a 50, maybe 60 million pound player. Uh, for me... For Spurs, he absolutely fits the bill. I would love to see him go for him um, again. That is a, a scenario where I would say you probably should try to pay closer to what they want. I also do agree that 12 months left in his contract makes it a bit different. But I actually think that Madison is, is such a key part of the puzzle um, for me that it could be worth it. If there's anyone you're going to go big on, it would be for him for me. Um and like I say, there's the base situation. If you're not aware, base or CAA base, a big uh, agency that represent Madison. They also happen to represent uh, Postacoglu, Porro, Richarlison, Son, fair few of the talented young players in the Spurs Academy as well. They've got a big influence on Spurs. Um, so if you if you kind of want that deal to happen, you, you've kind of got that, uh, how do I put this? pathway because of base that makes that a little bit easier but yeah it's all about that fee I think and it's interesting to see if the path is cleared for Spurs whether Spurs do that classic thing they have done most notoriously with Jack Grealish of just assuming it will get done eventually because the player will push for it and the fee will come down 
which definitely does not always happen. So I do think, especially for Postacoglu, now they're in this scenario where they've got an idea of their targets. They know who Postacoglu wants as well. They kind of have to act quicker, I think. With Conte, I know it was a more stable setup and they had every, all their kind of ducks in place or ducks in the line earlier in the summer. So they were able to bring in four players before they even went on the tour. And you had Longley who arrived just too late for the tour. Spence arrived during the tour. They had six players already by the time they came back from the tour. Whereas with Spurs, sometimes you're lucky if you've got one player came in in pre-season. Um, but now they're at the scenario where, yes, they've had that little bit of an awkward period of not knowing who the manager was, not knowing exactly who he would want. But we're past that now. And I think they have to move quite quickly. And I get the sense that you will see after Vicario, you will see at least one, maybe two more players coming in quite quickly after that, before certainly before the tour. Um, and you'd hope maybe another face before preseason even starts because, they, again, they have to give Postacoglu the best possible chance. And with his very different extreme of football, you've got to get that imprinted on these players' minds quickly. Um, and the, the longer they have with him, the less likely you are to have a longer protracted rocky period of results that always comes at his clubs that can be shortened the more time you give him with his players um so yeah we'll see we'll go into more specifics about those positions uh hopefully in the next video as we uh get to know more and more especially center back position you know th there's a there's a few kind of potentials out there that obviously are being looked at and that we keep hearing about but we kind of need to nail down exactly which ones they're going for um because yeah you know there's there's a fair few out there there's a chap at by leverkusen whose name has got completely gone out of my head taps i've got it even written down here somewhere if i can find it uh blah, 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 blah. you'd think i'd have had it written down really handy but i don't um edmund tap sober that was it 24 year old Burkina faso international it's an interesting one in the sense that he fits Postacoglu's system perfectly. But from what was reported, there was a suggestion that Arsenal had looked at him but hadn't gone for him because of the price, which would then make you wonder, well, Spurs were quite notorious for not going for someone because of their price. So, But he does fit the system. He's very fast, uh, very good on the ball. Someone in uh, read a German report on him compared him to Jerome Boateng at Bayern. Um, and yeah, he would fit it perfectly. I think he's very much a work in progress. He's only 24 years old, but certainly when I talk about a more experienced and a younger defender, if you get him through the door, it's certainly, um, and also Leverkusen, they were looking at Hikapi as well, weren't they? Um, again, whether that's changed because he was a Conte defender, I don't know, but there's a fair few defenders out there. Mark, Mark Gay as well, uh, Gay, I can never remember how you pronounce his name. One that they love, but I just think the price is going to be so big for him um, and the competition for him as well. But yeah, I, I'd give it another few days for the centre-back. I think once they've got the goalkeeper through the door, then you'll start to see the centre-back uh, situation kind of hot up as well. Um, and yeah, we still have to know what's going to happen with Clement Longley as well, with that very cheap deal that keeps getting spoken about as well. Um, and the other thing I'm intrigued to see is what happens with the £50 million. You might be, remember that Enoch... Uh, put in the £150 million offer for a capital share. Is it a capital increase? I'm trying to remember the exact expression. Spurs only drew out £100 million of it. And the initial press statement, uh, press release said that it had to be all of it withdrawn by the end of the year if uh, Enoch were to get an increased share in the club. However, they did not take out the last £50 million. But I remember asking back in February, I probably said it in one of these videos, I asked the club about it and was told quite clearly, no, the offer was extended. It still stands for 2023. So that other 50 million is there for the club to use. Um, so, yeah, it hasn't been. I've looked at Companies House today. It has not yet been drawn out uh, or that capital share increase put in. So it's there for them to use. Uh, obviously, I know this is quite depressing if you're thinking about where money's going, but Pedro Porro's deal obviously... It'll be 40 million euros uh, has to be paid towards. I think it's about 40 million pounds in all, including the loan. But 40 million euros has to be paid. I think it's July the 1st. So whether 
any of it goes towards that. I don't know how that works. I'm not saying that that's part of this year's transfer budget or anything. Technically, you would have thought that as it was a deal done in January with an obligation to buy, surely it's part of that budget. But I, I can't say that for definite. But I'm not saying that it's taken out of this year's bank, uh, bank account, this year, this summer's budget. But uh, yeah, we'll keep an eye on that 50 million. I will keep checking companies' house pretty much every day to check whether that's been withdrawn and uh, to be used. You'd presume they would. If the offer's there, why not? It's not like, I was going to say, it's not like it's uh, a, a loan. I guess technically if you're getting a bit of an ownership share for it, it it's in, as, in, es, in essence, it's buying that. Although I think at not the greatest price if I remember seeing the deal. Um, but yeah, anyway, point of what I'm saying is it's another £50 million that could be put towards stuff at some point if and when Spurs choose to use it. So there you go. Right, I'm going to head off. As I say, just a little kind of bonus video there for anyone that did happen to want it. Um, I still keep meaning I've got to do the Q&A at some point. There were some really great questions as well under the video a couple of uh, videos ago. Uh, so I will, if I do a Q&A as the next one or the one after, I'll try and go back to that video and look through the comments and go from there. So don't worry. It hasn't been lost in the sands of time. It hasn't. Uh, right. Time to head off. Um, hopefully there was some informative stuff in there that you got from that. Um, hopefully this new light is not too bright on my face, my sweaty face, because it's very hot because I had to shut all the windows. Um, generally, people seem to think it created a bit of a clearer video. Hopefully that's still the same case this week. Um, and yeah, I shall do another video after the weekend uh, talking about all the very many things to come at Tottenham Hotspur in what's going to be a very busy summer. So yeah, as always, stay healthy, stay safe, look after yourselves, and I shall catch you later. Goodbye.